It's your family tree, a mystery. Are you fascinated by genealogy? Well, hip, hip, hooray, let's talk DNA with Julie. The truth is in your genes. In Cut-Off Genes. <laughs> Welcome to Cut-Off Genes, the podcast that helps you find your truth using nothing but DNA. I'm Julie Dixon-Jackson, and I'm a genetic genealogist, henceforth known as a gen Genie. A Jen Jenny. Jen. I was trying something. <laughs> I dream of Jenny. <laughs> I'm Richard Castle. I am the producer and I am also dog wrangler mm-hmm. and co host of this podcast. Hello, yes. Julie. Hello, Richard. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing well. Okay. So I thought I had uncovered a family mystery. Ooh. I know. Um, I'll tell you the story. So do you see behind me, there's a picture of my grandmother over over there. I do see yes. it. It's that a lovely had, white frame. Yes. It had been in an older gold frame for many years. Mm-hmm. And this, this picture, which I love, of my grandmother, my dad's mom, was in his apartment in Boston. And then when he moved into assisted living before he passed away, he had it there. And so I took it when he died in 2011. Mm-hmm. And so it has been sitting here in my office since then. Well, I decided that the frame was getting a little old and it was it kept falling over and things sure. like that. So I'm like, I'm going to get a new frame. When I took out the picture, <gasps> there was another picture. Oh, I love when that happens. Behind it, uh-huh. you know, and it was a black and white picture of, uh, you know, I, I my grandmother and a man who I, I thought, well, it can't be my grandfather because my grandfather died actually really young. Okay. And so, and this was an older gentleman. So I'm like, who is this? And why is this in this frame? It's a mystery. You know, and thank goodness for the internet. Mm -hmm. I sent it to my cousins, Mm -hmm. you know, who live in uh, New Jersey, which is where she, my grandmother lived. Mm -hmm. And um, they all thought, oh, gosh, this is a mystery. We don't know who it is. And, you know, everyone was trying to guess. And and everyone assumed, yes, this is our grandmother. But before we ever knew her, because she was younger, my cousin gave it to my aunt. And Uh she says, that's not your grandmother. That's not my mother. She never wore glasses. That's, you know. Oh, it wasn't even your grandmother. (laughs) No. But, I mean, it looked enough like her. As a young woman or as a younger woman. Was it the picture that came in the frame in the store? No, it was not. (laughs) It turns out that this was my dad's second wife's parents. Oh, And then suddenly it all came clear to me. Oh, it all made sense. My dad was the kind of guy who would never go out of his way and never change anything in his apartment. And when he got this picture of his mother... It would be far too much work to remove the old picture. Or to even even get a new frame. frame. (laughs) So, you know, my... my, uh, His (laughs) wife had passed on. And this picture was obviously still still up. I mean, I'm guessing all of this. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. But, but I mean, I know my dad. And yeah. he would not yes. go out of his way. And so he's, oh, I'll just put it in there. And yeah, I don't know what to do with this picture. So I'll just keep it in there behind. So mystery solved. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a good tip. There's uh, lots of old picture, old picture frames. There are things hidden behind them. Yeah, I would and never And there's also thought. things written on the back of the pictures, which is often yes, yes, very helpful. Yes, which we don't ne- have now because of digital, right? We don't. Right. Yeah, it's everything's on people's devices. Yeah. That's why I try to write things down when I do print things up on the backs of them. Right. Yeah. Yes. Wow, Buddy's really shaking it off over there today. Yes. Well, it's his uh, third (laughs) anniversary with us, and so I think he's doing a little dance. Ah, he's doing the anniversary dance. (laughs) Yes, he is. Yes. Dog anniversary dance. What's going on with you, Julie? (laughs) Well, I had a morning where I went into a childhood black hole. A childhood YouTube black hole. Oh, wow. What did you watch? <laughs> okay, so... This is my life. I do that every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, me too. But usually it's not about me anymore. Uh-huh. Um, but this... So in Australia, I grew up in Melbourne, as everybody knows. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's Showtime, what they call Showtime. And it's the Royal Melbourne Show, which is basically the equivalent of a state fair. Um, okay. Here and it's called the Royal Melbourne Show, and it's at the showgrounds in Flemington, which is about five minutes from my house growing up. So I always drove by it, and I'm very familiar with the area. And when I was a kid, that was a big deal. That and Moomba. Um, I'll tell you about that another time. Moomba. Oh Moomba. my God. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but so, but the biggest thrill for kids about the show, other than um, the rides, was show bags which is like swag bags, basically, oh, okay. that, that you buy. They're sponsored things, and you would, so, you know, you would go and your parents would have to buy these things that were full of junk and candy, but it was like the best thing other sure, than Christmas. of you course. Know? So I noticed that a friend of mine had just been 
to the show yesterday and I was like, oh my gosh, the show. So I Googled show bags to see and there was this whole listing of the show bags that they have now and how much they cost and, and I just, I, I, I got enthralled. Then I started remembering things like there are products that I remember from my childhood that are obviously still there. Um, and they're still in the in the show bag. And they're still in show bags. They're still, you know, like certain candy brands and stuff that we don't that we don't have that are very famous. There. Yes, like Hoadley's and Daryl Lee. Um, so is Daryl Lee like Sara Lee here? Like Sarah Daryl Lee Lee's a candy. Oh, Daryl Lee is like C's. Oh, okay. Only much more colorful. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, because Sarah Lee is like a cheaper snack cake here. You yeah, know? no, Daryl Lee's an actual candy store. <laughs> yeah. That, that is okay. famous for its licorice. All right. And uh, they have a rocky road called Rock Lee Road, but yeah. I digress. Anyway. So they have um, Little Debbie's out there? No. <laughs> remember Little Debbie yeah. snack cakes? Yeah, yeah, we didn't have those in Australia. My grandmother loved Little Debbie. I don't Debbie. remember snack cakes as a kid. No? No. My, I remember my grandma made the best cupcakes Ever. Well, they, yeah, I mean, obviously. We didn't it, buy anything like any, we didn't, nobody ever bought cakes back then. Ugh. In Australia, especially. I mean, everybody baked. Really? Yeah. That's so weird. I mean, I, we hardly ever baked. We always bought like hostess snack cakes and, no. you know, uh, cakes, hostess cupcakes co- and cookies Twinkies. Cookies that we called biscuits we okay. would buy. And right. oh, Australians have the best biscuits. Ugh. So what were these products when you oh. in your in your show bags? Oh, in the show bags, um, uh, just a lot of oh, cherry ripe is my favorite Australian candy. If anybody would like to send me some, um, <laughs> so there was a cherry ripe one, but there were also a lot of like sponsored one. Like there was a pink show bag. Pink is huge in Australia. The singer Pink. Uh, uh, oh, Pink. Okay, yeah. real. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I pink like, is the, huge. That's her color? favorite color. <laughs> Is it pink with a, doesn't she spell it with an exclamation point where the I is? Oh, I don't know. Probably. Yeah. I pink as attention. in like P exclamation point. Mm-k. Mm-k. <laughs> mm-k. So anyway, but that got me on this whole thing of commercials, like commercials that I grew up on that are, that are forever in my mind. Specifically, there was a Kentucky Fried Chicken commercial that was a, that was a cartoon that I can't get out of my head ever. Oh, yeah. And it's still, I can find it on YouTube. Those things stay with you. I know. Oh, for sure. But so I just started looking at 70s, because my entire childhood was the 70s. Yeah. So uh, I started looking at 70s commercials from Australia. And, and it was so weird because I was like, I don't remember this. And then I went halfway through it and I'm like, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> just all of these memories came back. And all of the songs that I thought were uh, jingles that yes. were about that, like, like there's an airline called TAA, TAA mm-hmm. and their jingle was up, up and away with TAA. And then when I heard the actual original version of it, I thought, oh, they took the TAA song. <laughs> <laughs> there were actually commercials back in Boston when I was a kid that I still quote to this day. Oh, and sure. I, when I quote it to a friend from back there, it, like it's really a special shared thing. Like yeah. to, because it's not something everyone knows. And of course now I live in LA and you know nobody knows it unless they grew up in Boston right. at that time. Mm-hmm. And there were commercials really for um like the Boston Museum of Science uh-huh. that they showed all the time when you were watching kids, you know, after school cartoons and things like that. And so whenever there's a commercial for the New England Aquarium or the Museum of Science, I I could tell you not only the jingle, but what the stupid little kids said in Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) there. Yep. I think we all have those from our childhood, like regionally. Oh, yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. But yeah, it was a it's a I have such strong memories from my childhood because it was so specific and so different from here. Exactly. That it just, you know takes me back. And I remember things that I think people that live there now don't remember because my memories of that stopped when I was 15. And so that's all I know about it. No, that's true. It's like when you see somebody um, growing up, you don't notice the change as much. But then if you don't see somebody for years and then you go, oh my gosh, you know, you look so different. You've grown up or, you know, when a kid or something. But when you watch them grow, it doesn't, it doesn't register as much. That's true. Right. And I think about that now with people who, who are, um, like from LA and they've watched all these changes because LA is not the same city it used to be. Right. But like I've seen it gradually over the years I've been here, but people talk about, Oh, I remember when there were all these, um, fields and, and open space. I'm like, really in LA? But yeah. Yeah. Well, where we are right now was, um, a walnut grove. Did you know that? No. Yeah. Cause my house was the first house built on this walnut grove. Really? Yep. Uh, 
Walnut Grove. I know. I instantly I go little to house in the prairie. prairie. Yeah. <laughs> whenever, whenever um, I'm driving <laughs> up north, uh, there's like an area that that has uh, Walnut Creek. Well, no, it just looks oh. like the the credits where they were rolling, like oh, running it down the hill. Was. It could have been. Yeah, it was probably Agora. Those yeah. hills in Agora. But I'm, now you have to go way up to like San Luis Obispo to see that kind of stuff. But every time I, I drive by it, I start singing. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> dun, dun. And then the twin falling down. <laughs> Rolling yeah. down the hill. Yeah. Or so, the, the little blonde one. It's amazing how that yeah. stuff stays with you. Oh, it stays right? with you. Yeah. All right. Maybe we should talk about DNA now. How do we have to? Oh, yeah. yeah wait. It is a DNA podcast. Yes. I always forget. I know. <laughs> what is this about? <laughs> it's about our childhood yes, memories and musicals. It's about our musicals. childhoods and DNA. <laughs> um, Okay, let's get into Corrections Corner. Uh, yes. Uh, in the never-ending saga of GARP, the world according to GARP. Oh, my GARP, God. I'm sorry. I right? ever brought it up now. I know. I know. <laughs> so I, I of course, uh, as I am wont to do, Googled the scene and looked at the scene where Glenn Close tells the story. Oh, good. And I actually want to know the answer to this because okay. I haven't seen it in All probably right. 30 years. So in... Granted, maybe they visually showed it at another point in the movie. I don't think they did. But the scene is her telling the story to Garp as a child and a complete stranger who was, uh, she was a nurse. And so she was helping this man and she was telling the story to this man and her child. Okay. And she said, she told the story and then she said, and he said the one thing he ever said, good. Oh, so he did say it. Yes. See, I don't remember that. she said it. She said it, so you never saw him say it. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's funny that that part didn't stay, the good part didn't stay with me. Well, you visualized it too, probably. You probably didn't even realize that she had told you the story because in your head, you visualize it so you think that you watched it in the movie. Do you think? I I mean, I don't know that that they (laughs) would have depicted her climbing on top. Of the of this, you know, comatose man. Yeah, they would nowadays. Maybe. But I do remember a shot of her as a nurse, but... I don't know. Again, it's been over 30 years, yeah. you know, actually longer than that now. Mm-hmm. I think probably 37 years. When was it? 82, 81? Uh, anyway. Yes. <laughs> wow. Oh, well, it's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this puts all of our GARP controversy to bed. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And exit GARP. Okay. I wanted to make a clarification regarding the Australian man, William Hammersley, who was seeking a discharge from his adoption. Yes. Remember, he passed away recently. Yes. Um, after listening to it, I wanted to clarify something, because um, we started talking about name changes and stuff like that, how it's quite easy to do. I wanted to clarify that seeking a discharge is not the same as a name change. Um, it's removing all of the legal adoption paperwork and restoring the original identity. Okay. So it's just, it's a little bit. Right. I yeah. think that was unclear when we yeah. first talked about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. That's why I wanted to go back. Oh, good. Okay. You know. Yeah. It's always good, Julie. You, you never leave anything you know, alone. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't <laughs> true that. Yeah, your hu- your husband <laughs> deserves a medal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> she keeps going back over everything. We gotta make sure everything is right. I do. I do. I do. I just wanna I I cannot tell a lie. Thank you, George Washington. And we there we go again. Okay, let's talk about oh, oh, so uh the fall T V season is starting. Uh, okay. And there are a few uh, genealogy and DNA related uh, stuff. Program, stuff. New That's programs. Good. Yeah, thanks. Good word. Um, coming up. And there was one that actually, I guess it premieres on October 2nd on Fox, I think. Yeah. It's called Almost Family. Almost Family. All right. And it's got Brittany Snow and Emily Osmond in it. And uh, it's about... A daughter whose father was a no, well, I don't know if this guy was, but was a um, a very famous uh, fertility doctor. And turns out he used his own sperm in a lot. And so all of a sudden, all of these siblings of hers come out of the woodwork. Okay. And Based on true stories. Well, yeah, based I mean, on true stories. But it's also based on an Australian series. Oh. We're back to Australia, everybody, that I happened to fall come across and I looked at the breakdown of it. I said, that sounds exactly like that new one. Turns out it is. They have the characters have exactly the same names. Well similar names, but it's the same story. And coincidentally that show in Australia was called Showbags. <laughs> Showbags. I wanna say I want to write a show called Showbags, the musical. <laughs> 
I don't know why, but I think show bags is funny. It's almost like right. money money bags. Yeah, show bags, <laughs> the musical, and it's about women of a certain age that go to the state fair. Um, so and they're out looking for money bags, Mister Money Bags, at the state fair. That's brilliant. <laughs> wow. Um, so the one in Australia is called Sisters, and of course it's streaming on Netflix. And I have been binging. Oh, it. is it good? It is. Yeah. It is. I'm enjoying it. It very much. It's very much in the zeitgeist. It very much is about, you know, the all of the, the what DNA has done. Oh yeah, and to, I mean, I just I feel like it was less than a month ago when it was in the news that there was some fertility doctor, and oh, it turned every, out every every month right. it turns out that there's another one. That, yeah. You know, played God. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting. I'm curious to watch the American one now because watching this, uh, okay, so Australian and British TV, I always love to watch because their casting is so much more interesting for me because the beauty standards are just much more realistic Mm -hmm. um, in both of those places. So it's just more comfortable for me to watch, frankly. Mm. Um, The acting is very good. However, while the people look much more average. Yes. Their acting, while good, is generally a little bit over the top. Oh. Yeah, so I find that interesting that the Americans, like everything is very realistic and people are almost, because the camera's right in your face and they don't over overplay anything, mm-hmm. whereas the characters are very pronounced, um, but they look very normal. Hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting observation. I well, don't know that I've ever would have made that. And I love to watch a lot of British television. I, yeah. I, I don't know that I watch a lot of Australian, but we don't get a lot well, of Australian Well, you know what? Aus- and Australian, I think, is different than British in that way, too. Yeah. The Australians have, a um, as laid back as Australians are, they enjoy a good punch of personality. I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, I just went to see the Downton Abbey movie. You Me, know, too. This, wasn't it good? Yeah, I enjoyed it. Oh, my it. God. Maggie Smith is my spirit animal. Yeah, she's <laughs> just, great. She's always got to come back. Yeah. I mean, of course, the writer gives her that, but she right. just delivers it with such punch. Yeah. You, like, you just want to be the dowager countess when you get when you grow up. <laughs> I love her so much. Just the, the things that she can do without even saying a word oh, is oh, yeah. spectacular. She's, she's, she's like, a, um, oh, God, like B. Arthur, who could, like, just give yes. you a glance and make you and make you fall apart. You yeah. would laugh so hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 True. That is true. Well, we'll have to look out for that. Yeah, uh, so I watched the family. first five episodes of of that one. If you guys want to check that out too, of the Aus- of the, of the Australian okay. one. Um, it's called Sisters, and uh, I'm almost done with the first season. And it's that's on Netflix. It's on Netflix. Oh, cool. Maybe yeah. I'll check look it out. Look up the best way to find it because I I just wrote in the search bar on Netflix Australian or Australia, and all of the Australian programming comes up for you, oh, which wow. is a delight for okay. me. Okay. All right, so there you go. And that uh, next couple of weeks, I'm going to give uh, give you guys more updates about the new television programming that's genealogy-based. So that is this week's. Isn't it funny that that's all coming out now because it's so, like like you said, in the zeitgeist, yeah. in, in the news. And, mm-hmm. and so they start, you know, the television shows start to reflect that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah, me too. There's yeah. a lot. So should we take a break? Let's do that. All right. If you're enjoying Cut Off Jeans, please subscribe, rate, and review. Now, back to Julie and me. All right, we're back. Hey, I forgot to mention something in the opening. What is that? So I did, those of you on Facebook know that I did a little contest um, where I showed a picture of a quaka that I made <laughs> out yeah, of a sock. I, yeah, I don't even know what a quaka is, but I, it's I thought an Austral- it was It's a marsupial. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's, I don't know. Um, So, uh, and I have a ton of these toys in my house because that's what I do when I, sometimes my hands need to be doing something other than typing. Mm -hmm. Um, For 48 hours, I said, first 20 people or whoever does, uh, whoever puts a review, I didn't say what kind of review it had to be, but on the, on on iTunes, iTunes, um, you know, identify yourself to me and I'll send you one of these. Oh, that's good. Yeah. 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 And, and a few people participated. Uh, most of you have not sent me your address, however. <laughs> so those of you who did, there are a couple who have. 
Um, those of you who did it, please uh, PM me your address or email me your address or what have you. If Jules you, Jackson. If, if you don't reach out to Julie with your address, you don't get your quokka. There's no quokka. Um, by the way, there's only a couple of quokkas, and they may be gone by now. But we have lots of other. We have bunnies. We have we have dolls. I mean, you know, it's a and you never all, know what you might get. And they're all handmade by the host by of moi. this podcast. Yeah. Wow. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? Yeah, that is. I know I am. <laughs> I, you know what? I, well, I want to get a show bag with that in it. Ah, quaka show yeah. bag. That's quaka good. show bag. Quaka show bag. Quaka. 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 Anyway, so so thanks, uh, you guys, for participating. Let me know who you are and how I can send you something. And in future, in general, here's what I want to do. Um, whoever writes a review and wants to identify themselves uh writes an iTunes review, I should say, and wants to identify themselves, um, please do so. I'd be happy to send you anything. The only thing I can't do is pay for the postage every time because it ended up being way more than I thought it was going to be. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought, because they weigh nothing. I thought it would be, but apparently it's a mass thing. You're not Amazon? I am not Amazon. <laughs> yes. Julie Dixon, I am not Amazon. Prime. <laughs> Julie Prime. <laughs> So anyway, that offer stands if anybody's interested in having a handmade friend. Okay, um, let's go with, oh, there was a question on Facebook that I thought was interesting. A listener question? A listener question. Okay. No, actually, I'm going to tell the truth. It was a question in another uh, group, which is why I'm not going to say their name, but I'm stealing their question. You and your truth. I can't help it. And you're not even wearing jeans today. I know. <laughs> Okay, so the question was, which of the DNA testing companies would accept extracting DNA from human ashes? Mm. So they obviously have a relative's ashes, and they thought, you know. and um, Is that even possible? Well, no. Yeah, I was going to say. They... <laughs> but I thought I'd answer that yeah. anyway, because as soon as I saw that, I was like, what are people going to say? So, yeah, it's nearly, well, it says nearly impossible, and here's why. DNA is usually destroyed by high heat such mm -hmm. as fire, um, yes. ashes are very nearly an impossible source of DNA unless a fragmented tooth or bone may be extracted. Because sometimes there's like chunks. Yeah. I, That's I, gross. I, yeah. Um, again, oh, wait. So somebody wrote dynamic nucleic acid is a microbiological molecular substance and is easily destroyed by high heat. Human ashes are carbonized remnants. Anything more would be a lucky strike. Hmm. That was somebody's response. Clearly not mine, because I don't even know what I just said. And somebody might have used a lucky strike of the match to burn it. To, to <laughs> cremate somebody. That'd be quite a match. It would be a Or that person spontaneously it, it would have to be a very lucky strike if there was any DNA um, evidence left in that pile of ashes. Exactly. And also, somebody else mentioned that there is no guarantee that... The person in those ashes is your loved one. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. There's a like there's usually remnants of other people. You mean I may have spread the ashes of some random stranger into the ocean? Yes. After my, thinking it was my father. Did I ever tell you about the story about when uh, after my dad was cremated, he died in New Jersey, and I was bringing his cremains mm -hmm. back here mm -hmm. so I could spread them in the ocean, and um. Well, I thought, you know, how am I going to get on the plane with this? Because with all the security and you've got like a box full of... I don't think you're allowed to travel with cremains. You are. Oh, yes. I didn't think you yes. were. Okay. Um, but I was worried that, that it would look like I was I was going to have like a midnight express moment where like they, they, they x-ray it and right. realize like, oh my God, all this white powder, you know, <laughs> like I'm trying to do... It's some, not white. <laughs> well, whatever it <laughs> yeah, is. Okay. It, they, can't, they can't tell <laughs> yes, in the x-ray machine. But, you know, I have to say the... Um, the TSA mm -hmm. in, at uh, JFK Airport in mm -hmm. New York were so good and so professional. And, you know, they've seen it all. Oh, yeah. You know, so it was nothing. Mm -hmm. I just told the person before I put it in, look, th these this are my, my dad. this is my dad's yeah. remains and whatever. And they, they, you know, did a special thing where they tested it for drugs or whatever, where they sprinkled something or they, I don't know, dusted it did or they whatever. Open it? No, 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 no. Oh, just okay. the outside of oh, it, okay. like for residue. <laughs> well, you that's know, weird. no, okay. no. <laughs> And and uh, put it through and said, you know, mm. thank you so much. And I was, all that worry was for nothing. But I think the key was to just let them know that you're not just sending something through right. and let them discover what it is. Like, yeah. like give yeah, them yeah, a yeah. heads up of what it is. Always give them a heads up. Yeah. That should be a, yeah, standard, yeah. you know. And it was weird, like, because I put it in the overhead bin, you know, <laughs> above me. And I oh thought, God, God I, I hope there's no turbulence. <laughs> Oh my, God. my dad sprinkling was, down on me. I hope it was very well uh, sealed. It that's was very was well trying. sealed. That's good. That's good. You know, you can get um, 
jewelry where you can wear a part of your loved one's cremains? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, that's not for me, you know. It kind of is for me. Yeah? Yeah. I kind of... And you can all... Well, of course, I make jewelry, so I'll I'll probably come up with something that I'll I'll make. But I kind of like the idea of having my dad with me. Yeah. I I guess maybe I think of it in terms of, like, I have something of my mother's that I keep with me all the time. But it's not her actual person. You know? I kind of like the idea of having <laughs> yeah. my actual dad there. I'm and, not sure why. And one of the reasons why I decided to spread it out into the ocean was because, well, actually because my dad loved the ocean. Mm-hmm. And also because I remember when my mom died and she had some cremains of a good friend of hers, you know, that was just her friend. And I thought, well, now what do we do with it? You know, like, what do you do with somebody's oh, cremains that don't yeah, have yeah, anything yeah. to do with you? And, you know. Yeah, if they're holding on to somebody's cremains remains then you know know, how does that get right and so i thought well let's just dispose of them in a very respectful way and then nobody has to like care you know go wonder what after i die what are we going to do with rich's dad yeah 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 (laughs) i still have my dad's um in my living room yeah (laughs) i've told you that before but i we plan on uh, i i would like to take them up to the mountains or something because you know he loved to but i I do want to keep some though i do want to keep just like a little a little bit yeah you could tell your kids, you know. Yeah, this is grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> Something else. Here's, yeah. your, here's your legacy. I'm leaving that this for you. That and your teeth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that are in the nightstand. <laughs> the teeth in the nightstand. Yeah. I am weirder than I ever thought. Okay. <laughs> I have a caveat. Oh, a caveat. Beware of outliers. Okay. So uh, somebody in another group told um, a story that is important that we all hear about and obviously um i don't have permission for her to say her name i'm going to tell her story without identifying anybody it's very interesting well if she if she posted about it online it was in a private group though oh i see yes yeah Yeah. so that's why i'm not being very specific about it yes we'll call her joan we'll call her joan (laughs) i just like the name (laughs) go ahead so um, she's an adoptee, and she'd tested at Ancestry. A year prior, she'd found her birth mother through a second cousin because she knew her name, um, although she didn't have her full name, but she was able to do that through a second cousin. She'd passed away in uh, a few years earlier, and so no one knew who her birth father was. Okay. So she basically, like me, had to wait around for a, a match, match to, come. to yes. come in. Right. So she finally one day got a no- notification that she had a first cousin match. And she was excited, so she reached out to the guy. She knew it was on her birth father's side, because it wasn't on her mother's side. So she reached out to this guy and asked him if he had an uncle. And he said his father had only one brother and no other siblings at all. So that's pretty. If he's a first cousin, his father's brother must be her father. Okay, gotcha. Pretty basic. So she wrote a letter to the uncle to the match's uncle, explaining that she was searching and the situation, and she got a phone call a few days later, and he did date her birth mother once, and she was completely welcomed into his family with open arms by him and his kids, not so much his wife because he had had to admit to infidelity while they were engaged. Oh, yeah, that gets a little ugly. Yeah, that's a... Anyway, she decided she wanted to ask him to go ahead and test, which I recommend everybody do. Sure. Um, just to be 100% sure. You want to confirm, yeah. Uh, absolutely, as we all know my story. Right. Yeah. I know. Um, so You're like the cautionary tale, right? I am. I am. <laughs> right. So, uh, But before the results came back, they were both excited, and so he flew out to meet her. And while he was there, she decided to check ancestry to see if the results were in and they were in but the results were shocking Ooh, what were they well it said that he was a close family match and it was 1762 santa morgans which is consistent for uncle oh so it was wrong Clearly. Clearly. Um, so they were both devastated. Oh, that's yeah. so sad. And he flew home the next day, um, and she called her cousin, the the cousin, the first cousin, mm-hmm. to uh, tell him what was going on. And so he agreed to test his father, mm-hmm. who was still living. And he did, and the father came back as her father. Mm. So they both had had relations with her mother. Well, yeah. Oh. That's been known to happen. Right? Yeah. Because, I mean, again, he, what are the odds, right? Yeah. What are the odds that this guy who was her uncle 
could actually have thought if it's that he was her father. If it's in a neighborhood, yeah. it's, you know, it kind of, especially, especially like... But two brothers? Yeah, it's like creepy. Like having Whatever. the same girlfriend? Well, no, not, not really girlfriend. girlfriend yeah. Actually, I have had a case before. I've had more than one case before where two brothers uh, were a possibility for a mm, father. Okay. Actually. Like, uh, possibilities in that they both had had sex yes. with the woman yes. and not necessarily possibilities just because. Yes. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. They Ooh. both, like, we knew for a fact that they both had. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Yikes. So he was the father. So what happened here? Yeah, what did happen here? So the half-brother still was showing up as a first cousin, obviously. He had a very uh, um, low, what he had was a either a high first cousin match or a low half-sibling match. It was 12.05. Okay. Um, now that is even lower. If you recall my story when my brother's results came in, he matched me at that time at 1350, something like that. Okay. Which is on the low end. Yeah. Not as low as this, but still enough to where I couldn't, I was like, what if it's an outline? Right. You know, and so I had to have some experts look at it and really break it down for me. Right. And that's how we ended up solving it. Um, but in this case... She didn't need an expert. She, she actually, was just, well, know. and she hadn't been doing it that long, and so she didn't really know that that was an, an unusually high first cousin match. Right. Um, so that's what we call an outlier. And if she'd have known that earlier, you know, she would have known to look a little closer at it. And what you do, if you have a match that's unusually high or low that you're trying to place in a specific place, you need to look at your other matches and see how they match. And the what are the odds tool is the best way to do that, which is on DNA Painter, and it tells you where you put people in the correct place on the tree and do their Santa Morgan uh, matches to who you're trying to... I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, if it's an, you need to really... Uh, really look at your other matches, and if need be, go to an expert to have it to have them break it down for you. Cool! Okay? Wow, that's so, an interesting story. Yeah, I mean, we all use this shared Santa Morgan project, yeah. which is the one that Blaine Bettinger um, did by polling basically yes. everybody. And so, you know, and it's usually it's within a range of something, but there's always a chance that it can be slightly lower or slightly higher. It yeah. happens. Yeah. It can happen. Wow. Not okay. very much, but it happens. Okay. Okay. So uh, always beware of outliers. Shall we take a break? Please. Thank you for listening to Cut Off Jeans with Julie Dixon Jackson and Richard Castle. That's me. All right, kids. Story time. Yay. Get tucked in and comfortable. This is part two of author and adoptee Laureen Pittman's conversation that uh, last week she told the story about how she found her mother and what that was like. And now we're just getting into DNA and how she or if she found her father. Ooh, let's listen. All right. I just turned 50. Big, big, uh, milestone. And, you know, I, I kid around in the book about how I, I don't know what really prompted me to start really thinking about it again. Um, but I don't really think I was thinking about my biological father. I thought that would be a bonus to, to find out about that. But um, nobody knew who he was except for my uh, birth mother, if, if she indeed remembered him or knew who he was. I mean, it could have been one of several. I had no idea at that point. So I didn't think I'd ever find anything out about that, but I started to dig more into um, her side of the family and I was doing some research, you know, on ancestry and I thought, and I knew who her siblings were on uh, Facebook, you know, I'd kind of been stalking them and, and stuff. And, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to do the, this DNA thing was starting to happen, starting to get more and more popular. So I did it and did you know when you did it that you could have the relative matching component or did you just do it for um, uh, ethnicity? Well, I knew that they, they were, that I could, that, that there was a possibility of relative matching. Okay. But in my mind, I mean, I, 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 back then 
I wasn't thinking that I'd find out anything interesting because I figured anybody that had a match with me, and this is how naive I was. I mean, I know now that you build these trees and you figure out, you know, how uh, how you're related to a certain a person by building several mirror the mirror trees and all of this. But I um, back then I I just figured any kind of family match or you know distant cousin match or something will will send me an email or a message and. Say, what are the surnames that you know? How are we related? And I thought it was something like that, you know, and I, think, well, well, I, don't know I mean, theoretically, kids. that's what it's supposed to be, but it never really works out that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, you know, being adopted and I got, you know, in the beginning, I got a couple of those and I thought, um, I, 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 at first I started to tell my whole story, you know, oh, I'm adopted. I don't really have any, you know, yeah. It'll be of any meaning to you. And um, so that, you know, side note, I just need to do a side note. Don't do that adoptees. Okay, go ahead. Right. Right. (laughs) Definitely. You are absolutely right. Reach out to everybody. And there, you know, and I know that now. And um, I started doing that because as you'll see, when you read the book, it opened up my entire, the paternal side of my family by doing that. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, it was like a needle in a haystack with this direct match when I logged on and boom, biological father right there. Um, wait, was, what? Your biological father was right there? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, that never happens. A, I know it. And I mean, and, and so there, I, I'm, I mean, I was blown away and wrote to him right away, you know, and I, and, um, I'm thinking, what is this, you know, 70 some year old dude, you know, why has he got his, he must know about me. I thought he must know, you know, that he has a daughter out there. Maybe he's looking for me. So of course I write to him. To make a long story short, and obviously you can read it in the book, but he had no idea I existed. And uh, even more interesting, had, could not remember, has no memory of uh, Margaret, my biological mother, or the um, incident, you know, that created me. He, and he still doesn't. And we've been in touch now for, and, and I believe him. He, uh, they were, this was in the 60s, and uh, he admitted to a lot of the, um, um, you know, recreational drug use that was going on back then. It's sure. Um, and in fact, that's how my bio, that's why my biological mother uh, was arrested. She was arrested on drug charges. Um, but my biological father was not. And he went on to just become this great artist, you know, hippie dude. And he still is kind of calls himself an old hippie, but um, so he had no idea I existed. And at first didn't thought there was a mistake as a lot of people do when they look at these DNA results, they go, this can't be true. Um, and, and that was, you know, he, he was very open with me. He didn't just shut me down and say, well, no way. He, he uh, kept writing to me and we got this email, um, you know, correspondence going back and forth. And the information I had from the non-identifying uh, information from the social worker and uh, from the DNA, it took some convincing and some time, but he finally came to realize that he's, He's my dad. So, I mean, I was going along the whole time knowing that it was that it was him. You know, I asked him, why, why are you why did you submit your DNA to 23andMe? You know, if you weren't looking for me or what was your goal in doing that? And this is what kind of opened it up for us. He said, well, I don't know a lot about my own father. My mother and I were never close and she wasn't very forthcoming with any information. All I have is my father's name on uh, my birth certificate. And he'd been, you know, looking for more information, been writing to people and trying to find more information about his own father, you know, based on the name on this birth certificate. Um, So we kind of banded together and I helped him. And my, uh, my friend who helps me with the genealogy, she started nosing around and helping with this, but but um, I'll just tell you, you're right. Whoever contacts you wanting information about the DNA match, respond. Even if you don't think you have any information that will help them or help you, because that's how we found um, his biological father. And we connected, and hence the title of the book, The Lies That Bind, by his lies and my lies in our own lives came together and um, now we're bound forever. And we, he, it, it turns out that his birth certificate was falsified. He was not adopted, but 
Um, it's it's a very uh, complicated story. He Go was ahead. born in 1943, which was right around the time of World War II, and there were a lot of secrets and a lot of things going on, and and uh, he was uh, of German heritage, so it it's uh, very interesting and, and and intriguing, and and together, I mean, he, I mean, imagine if a 70 year old, you know, ex hippie finding out through DNA through email that he has a 50 year old daughter he knows nothing about. Oh, I don't have to imagine that. It happens every day for me in my life. Well, right, right, right. For you, it does. <laughs> So anyway, we we we're, we're in, we uh, we are in touch uh, still. I go visit him all the time, and it's it's great. So we are still working through some of the mysteries uh, of of his side of the family, and and it's it's fascinating. That's great. That's there's so so much so much going on in that. When you think that you're just going to read a, you know a, a book about finding family, and then it turns into even much more than that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you and uh, you're talking about writing your story. I am. I am. Yay. You know, I have my whole story about being an adoptee and about finding my biological family, but I have a parallel story about what happened in my adoptive family that shouldn't that shouldn't have happened in the first place. Well, it's been a really awful time that, you know, and I it's been so bittersweet because I've was able to finally fulfill my dream of yeah. finding out who I was and I got slapped in the face with it on the other side. Um really the only recourse I have is to write about it. So I want to hear that. I want. I want. I want to read that story. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I, I'm. I was thinking of starting to write it now, but it's just very triggering. This is all pretty recent, so I can't even just talking about it is going to make me crazy. So I'm going to have to be in a yeah. more, more healed place. I think when I do it. Um, you find out that it's a journey. It's like you. You said. You know those words that you just said. Um, I think I need to be at a different place in my healing, you know, before I can write it. It's like, you know, it will be a different place, but you're still going to have healing to go. It's like, you know, it's just this journey. And us ad- adoptees just, I had a friend who adopted a child from um, from Russia. It was international adoption. And he's a teenager now getting ready. To, well, he is driving now, I think. So he's 16. Um, and I can remember when he was younger, we had a discussion and she said to me, you know, we were talking about being adopted and I was talking to her about her son and, and uh, I was talking to her about my journey. And, um, and I said, well, you know, you, 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 you'll be surprised at things that you'll have to deal with, you know, as, as he gets older, being that he's, he's an adoptee. And she goes, well, you know, we don't think of him as, as an adoptee. He was adopted. He was adopted. That happened to him a long time ago. That's not, that's not who he is now. He's my son. And I just laughed at her, you know, in an, I mean, we're friends in a, in a nice way. And I yeah. said, be open-minded because he is an adoptee and that is who he is. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That's a, that is a perfect example of, uh, them, of, of, uh, adoptive people. Um, and it's not their fault. They just need to read more, you know, <laughs> but yes, thinking right. that they're, that these children they adopt are blank slates and just gummy bears with no, with no past. And they're going to be able to mold them into whoever they feel they should right. be when some of us are just, I've, I've always described it with my, with my parents as it's like we're from different planets. We've worked through yeah. it, but it's, you know, it, you couldn't have got a more mismatched family than mine. It was, if it was a pitch for a TV show, it, they would say it's too far fetched. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, tell me and the listeners once again, where they can get the book uh, and how. Um, it is called The Lies That Bind, an adoptee's journey through rejection, redirection, DNA and discovery. And um, you can get it on Amazon. All right, Lorraine Pittman, it's been so great speaking with you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us and to give us a little snippet of your story. Uh, go out and get that book, guys. It's it's fascinating. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Thanks, Lorraine. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, and that is Lorraine's story, or part of it. She didn't tell the whole story, obviously, because she wrote a book right. about uh, called The Lies That Bind. Now we'll have to go out and buy The Lies That Bind and, and buy read it. Buy The Lies That Bind <laughs> and get it on Amazon. I still think it's a great title. I do, too. Yeah, yeah. Let's be the lies that bind. <laughs> Thank you, Lorraine, for telling your story and sharing it with us on the podcast. Thanks, Lorraine. It was great. Really fun talking to you. 
So for those of you that are interested, I am Richard Castle, and you can follow me on the Twitter at Castle Songs, or you can go to my website and find out all, all the things I do outside of this podcast. Um, that's richardcastle.com. I'm Julie Dixon Jackson. On the Twitter, I'm at Jules Jackson with two O's. The podcast on Twitter is at Cut Off Jeans Pod. Join the Facebook group, Cut Off Jeans Podcast. Answer a question. It's always fun. And if you'd like to email me directly to give me your address so I can send you a fun friend, um, please do so a at... Quaka. A quaka. <laughs> or something else. Maybe a koala. Um, at Jules Jackson at cutoffjeans.com. Julie, we have a little catchphrase around here. I don't know if you heard it. Oh, we do. Yeah. You know what it is? No. The truth is in your jeans. (laughs) 